For Krima Medias Polity, I'm Sane Lamini. Joining me today to discuss her book titled The Inheritors, an Intimate Portrait of a Brave and Bewildered Nation is Eve Banks. So if the book narrates uh, South Africa's history, profiling three South Africans from different backgrounds, as an American, what sparked an interest that resulted in this book? I've sometimes said that to Americans, I'm not sure that we know how many resonances and similarities South African history has with U.S. history. One has to say it's not mostly similar, but the history of apartheid had a lot of kind of overlaps and explicit linkages with Jim Crow in the United States. Some of the Afrikaner settler history had um, a lot of overlaps with manifest destiny in the US and the westward expansion and, and the way that dynamics around race, but even sort of the idea of the two countries as exceptional places in different ways um, on their own continents were, were very, very similar. So I think when I started to read about the history of Africa and Latin America and the Caucasus and Asia, I just thought, this is a country that I should know a lot more about, that I should also go visit and see how people are doing and what they're doing and how they're feeling and the ambiguities of that. Because also there was a lot of interest in the United States in, in the movement to end apartheid and in 1994 and in the election and in the beginning of Nelson Mandela's presidency. And then that awareness, unfortunately, kind of tapered off. And I thought it's it's, it's so interesting and so valuable for us to understand actually the aftermath, um, how people are putting the country back together. And you start with the story of Tipu and Malaika who had different struggles. What theme or message are you trying to share with the readers? Yeah, so Tipu, I profiled three people in the book two of whom were born right around 1970. And Dipua was one of those in Medellin's in Soweto. And the reason that I was drawn to that, I spent 10 years reporting on Maracana as a journalist and fees must fall and a lot of different stories in the country, Zuma's presidency. I arrived in Cape Town, first time I had ever been to South Africa to live here on Zuma's inauguration day in April. 2009. So I followed a lot of those stories as a journalist, but over the way, I met and interviewed a great number of people. And I think I was really drawn to Dipuo because she had been a teenager in the 80s and very involved in the anti apartheid struggle in her neighborhood. But, you know, there was a part of her, she told me, that kind of assumed that apartheid would still exist when she was an adult and that this would be the framework in which she would enter adult life and make her adulthood and be struggling against it. And then rather quickly, she was, you know, had the destiny to become an adult in a very, very different political situation in different countries. So she had come of age right when the country was transitioning. And then she also, on her own birthday in 1992, her 20th birthday, gave birth to her first and only daughter, Malaika, who would then be part of the born free generation, born before 94, but not have kind of explicit memories herself of apartheid. And she and her daughter had such an intimate relationship. I hope if people read the book, they'll feel there's a lot in there about mother daughter dynamics that are very universal and very complex and very loving and also very intense about, in a way, I think Dupuo said and Malika said that she hoped that her daughter's life would sort of make real things that she had fought for. And that became a burden on Malaika in a sense. But they also had very open communication, a very intense and deep, have an intense and deep relationship. And so they talked very frankly about things that a lot of us, I'm my mother's only daughter, kind of are dynamics that exist, but are a little under the surface. And I was really touched by the openness with which they discussed, you know, Malaika would say, I'm afraid that, you know, things that you missed out on as a 
as a you as a child and as a teen young woman in the 80s you're almost pressuring me to redeem that make up for that have all those experiences that you fantasized about that you'd hoped you would have and i want to live my own life i and and have my own you know difficulties in a sense i'm not going to be the redemption of your of your struggle so if you also address the issue of paternity between the poor and her father and the story resonated with me because it's something that we've seen a lot in our communities. Can you briefly share with our viewers? Yeah, that went through multiple generations. So Dipuo, when Dipuo was born in 1972, her father also questioned her paternity, which I think was extremely hurtful to the women in the family, obviously. And he was quite absent from Dipuo's life. And then Another pain point for Dipu was she met Malika's father in the anti-apartheid movement. And he was a man who was considered very brilliant, young, destined for wits, destined for a post-apartheid level of success. And he had ambivalent feelings about his responsibility. I mean, you see how women, the women in these stories have a sense of duty and they, they They want to take responsibility. They want to raise their children. But he had more of a feeling like, I think there was a story told to him by his family and around him that he was going to become a great academic, become a political leader. And he didn't want this disruption in that trajectory and that storyline. And so he became a presence that was sometimes present, but sometimes absent in Malika's life. seemed to be wanting to choose in that way, in a way that was very painful for both her and Dipua. And in the book, you also paint um, a picture of things falling apart. We do have power outages, which are disrupting everything in our country and other struggles. What would you say are similar struggles uh, between our country and America? It's such an interesting question because when I first moved here and I, I made friends as well as did interviews and I would sometimes say, you know, I think in some ways the health care setup is better in this country. The, the, sur- the sort of attention that one gets from GPs, the pay structure, and, and I, people wouldn't believe me. <laughs> they would say, no, it must, I know it's better in America. And I, I would struggle because I would say, well, I just came from there and I'm American, especially I don't know, middle class people or even more educated kind of really want to hold on to the belief that um, America was at that time, it's maybe changed over the last decade, but a country that we can hold on to as a model, we must be more like that country and kind of get to the f- first world is a a word that I would hear a lot um, from people. And I would say, you know, I think it's worth spending time in Europe, it's worth, if one can, or worth reading about American struggles because, you know, maybe there are routes for South Africa that are different. And, you know, once one gets to the point where America is now, you you might not feel like everything has been solved. And so one thing that I think is very resonant that I experienced having grown up in the 90s in America and and then come and spent 12 years here is exceptionalism and the sense that the country could live up to an ideal and has a responsibility in the world or on the continent to be a superhero, to be the place where everyone wants to come, to be the kind of story that breaks the mold of let's say here of other African post-colonial countries that it's going to do better and and retain a kind of glow and aura from from the late 90s, from Mandela's presidency. It's going to be an exceptional story, a miraculous country. And I think in in America has an exceptionalism that I think people are familiar with. It's going to be the city on the hill. And I really experienced how that becomes a trap and a a confinement that in this way, um, 
there's no way to exceed expectations for these two countries. You either meet expectations of growth, of equality, all kinds of expectations, which don't necessarily can't be altogether, you know, accomplished, or you fail them. And there's not really a sense of like, well, people didn't have high expectations for us as a nation, and we've shown them. Um, I spent two years living in Kenya, and there was a lot of dire predictions after the 2008 election violence of this country is going to become a failed state, it's going to fall apart. And I think people feel proud to some extent that they've learned that they took that experience and said, we, we don't want to go down that path. We want to strengthen our democracy to some degrees. We want to root out corruption to some extent. It's not perfect, but they feel they they exceeded expectations. And there's no route for that in either of our two countries, I think. It's either we meet these stratospheric expectations or there's this sense things are falling apart, things are failing. And it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because there's just a lot of pessimism and, and a, a feeling like everything has to be fixed at once, you know, that the government has to be replaced, corruption has to be rooted out completely, ESCOM has to start to work in an ideal fashion, equity has to be, you know, and or that the country that we've disappointed ourselves and we've disappointed the world. You also speak about um, an African, if I may say so, Crystal, who also gave you a different perspective from what you share about the poor and Malaika. Can you briefly tell us about his story without giving too much because we still want our viewers to buy your book? Yeah, I think one thing, I don't know how you experienced reading the book, but it's sometimes I'll say it reads like a novel more than maybe typical nonfiction. So it's a little hard to speak about because there's things that happen in people's lives and plot points that one doesn't want to sort of give away. And these people um, have very ambiguous feelings about their own history and their country. And I spent years with them and I think it'll surprise people how frank they ultimately became about ways they wish that they could split with their communities and also ways they want to honor a history that that's kind of being pushed into the past and Christo grew up on a farm near Freiburg just south of Botswana in a quite a tr traditional Afrikaner farming community his father was a cattle rancher and played in a Buddha music band and when I went to interview his parents um I speak some Afrikaans and they, they really only speak Afrikaans, uh, which I think some people in the cities may not realize there's still families like that, um, that don't speak English. And he then was one of the very last white South African men drafted to fight in the apartheid army. And he was conscripted in 1989 and ended up doing township duty, which was not what he had been sold in a sense by TV and by Heiskhanuet and by the government that he was going to be doing. It was more of this bit of a heroic border war. Um, obviously that wasn't a heroic battle, but it was sold that way in a sense to teens to make them excited about being drafted. And his struggle, if I can put it that way, I don't know that I want to use that word, but he battled with the fact that he had been kind of a loner in school and found a sense of community in the military in boot camp and his best friends were from the army and the training experience he really loved it was like a camp it was a a bonding you know it was a way that they had designed it to make it feel that way but he really had experiences training for the military that he had a hard time erasing from his life story, which he then wanted to do in the late 90s, because he did recognize the goals that this military was set, set out to do wasn't weren't good. And yet he had such a nostalgic feel for this period. And I think for me, I wouldn't say that there were similarities between Depuo and Christo. They were born around the same time. That would be too uh, reductive and incorrect. And yet they both had memories of the intensity that they had committed themselves to their respective struggles 
and the, the, the bonds that they had made with people through fighting for a cause at the time that they did as teens that then were kind of memory hold and it was sort of said well now let's just move on and be a different society and and they really grappled with nostalgia at times again it's not quite the right word and the reason i wrote the book is i hope people will read that it's it's this complex bundle of feelings but with the sense that this had been their coming of age and becoming adults had been in these struggles. And you see Christo really grapple with how to acknowledge the reality that he does in some ways that this all had been both a wasted and immoral effort that he'd been conscripted into. You know, sometimes in America, people say, oh, your best years of your life are college when you're 18 to 21. This was a time when he was in the military and to kind of reboot and wipe it from the memory turned out to be very difficult for him. Thank you very much for your time, Even I hope a lot of viewers will also find the book interesting. I hope it has some of the reality in it Mm -hmm. of some of the humor by which South Africans deal with the difficulties in this country. And, And people also, I find, have mixed feelings about it. Should we make a meme, should we find this funny or should we just be angry and just be sad? But I think it's, it's, a, it's a reality of the country that it, it has a lot of ambiguity of feeling and lightness and in, in people's own lives. And I hope that people really see themselves in a way that's exciting um, and makes them feel like, yeah, I, I sort of have a place here. This, is, this reflects my story in this country. It's an effort to treat ordinary South Africans as just as worthy of biography and storytelling as, you know, a very top political leader. I hope people will enjoy that. There was a former political writer for the New Republic, Ife Banks, in conversation with Polity, discussing a book titled The Inheritors, an intimate portrait of a brave and bewildered nation.